The G7 adopted the U.S.-led proposal "Build Back Better World" as an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. But can it compete with China's investment? We know China's Belt and Road Initiative provides loans to countries that usually can't get from、uh, international financial markets. So, how will the B3W compete with this strategy? So, the great thing about、uh, the B3W loans, what we utilize, for example, in the Blue Dot Network, is that it combines. The best of the public and the private sector. Despite the G7's newly formed alliance against China, China is still the hottest spot for foreign investment. Can Beijing form its own alliance to battle the Western world? Nobody trusts the Chinese Communist Party. Keith Krug was the Under Secretary of State responsible for economic diplomacy during the Trump administration. The Blue Dot Network, his team drafted, was adopted by the Biden administration, and is now the Build Back Better World initiative. This Silicon Valley veteran has a good track record of defeating China's economic aggression, particularly Huawei's ambition to take over the global 5G communications. I discussed with him the strategies to deal with the China challenge, what works and what doesn't. I'm Simon Gao, and you are watching Zoomi in China. Thank you, Secretary Clark, for being with us today. Let's talk about G7. The G7 adopted your clean infrastructure strategy. The new name is called Build Back Better World, or the Clean Green Initiative. What is this goal, and why do you think the Biden administration adopted your idea? This is great news. That the G7 leaders endorse、uh, this initiative. The,、uh, you know the Blue Dot Network now,、uh, uh, the Clean Green Initiative, but G7 adopted under Build Back、uh, Better World.、Uh, and the, the the difference between the Blue Dot Network and, and this, it's in essence the same,、uh, and it's governed by the same set of trust principles. For example, as the Clean Network. Those are things like transparency,、uh, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for property of all kinds, respect for sovereignty of nations, respect for human rights, respect for the planet and the environment.、Um, and so, I think uh, uh, the Biden administration was really wise in taking advantage of the momentum and all the work that's been laid、uh, with the Blue Dot Network.、Uh, I announced it in 2019. At the、uh, Indo-Pacific Business、uh, Forum in conjunction with Japan and Australia, we had got、uh, the 12 Three Seas nations to join. We got Taiwan to join. So this is really great. It's going to put a lot of oomph in it. Right. You know, China's Belt and Road provides loans to countries that they usually can't get from the international financial market. So how will the B3W or the Build Back Better World initiative compete with that strategy? So the great thing about、uh, the B3W loans, what we utilize, for example, in the Blue Dot Network, is that it combines the best of the public and the private sector. So these are、uh, private sector loans, but they're also augment, uh, augmented with, for example, the Development Finance Corp, the DFC, which、uh, I shared over the last few years, and and、uh, the amount of money in that、uh, in the Endless Frontier Act just got extended from 60 billion. Uh, to 100 billion. Now, when you talk about the Chinese loans, those come with strings attached. First of all, these these loans they make them sign like a a, a non-disclosure about the loan terms themselves, and they're loan shark terms, where、um, they have high interest rates and and they and, and their collat their collateral is、uh, I mean it's really loan shark term. For example,、uh, the country of Ecuador.、Uh, Had at one point thirteen billion dollars alone、uh, with China, and if they didn't happen to pay it back, then China had the right to seize any asset in Ecuador other than its military and its historical artifacts. So this changes the game entirely. You know the G7 communique named China when talking about Hong Kong, Taiwan, and human rights abuses, but. Avoided mentioning its name in Xinjiang labor abuse, 
forced technology transfer, intellectual property theft, and etc. So there's a report indicating that there is still a very sharp divide within the G7 in terms of how hard they want to pressure China. So what is your opinion on G7's attitude towards China, especially Germany? You know, it's really unfortunate uh, that they didn't come out and name uh, Xinjiang, um, uh, you know, because that, that actually would have forced uh, to make some for some of these countries uh, to endorse the U.S. and the U.K.'s uh, by calling it genocide. And, and, and especially it's unfortunate they didn't talk about uh, call it out intellectual property and forced technology transfer, which is also another elephant in the room. Um, and, and, and I think the reason why you don't see it called out is, I mean, it's because of, of what I call the Chinese doctrine of seducing with money and reinforcing with intimidation and retaliation. There's huge commercial interests uh, at stake. I mean, uh, we're putting together the Clean Network. We saw uh, the Chinese ambassador in Germany threaten uh, that if they pulled Huawei out, then uh, the German automakers would be cut out of, out of the Chinese market. We've, we've seen this bully. But G7 is a perfect opportunity because, you know, we've all faced bullies sometimes in our life. Um, and all I know is that when you confront a bully, they back down. And with your friends by your side, they really back down. And that's what the G7, that's what the Clean Network uh, provides, is their strength in numbers. And there's power in unity and solidarity. And we saw that with uh, the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And G7 is one of the, one of the few uh, organizations that doesn't include China. The other one is the OECD. Even the G20 includes China. So, and they've infiltrated all the international organizations. So I hope next year uh, these other nations have a little more courage. The NATO statement that just came out also put an emphasis on China. It calls China a systematic challenge to the rule-based international order. So what do you make of NATO's statement? Uh, will NATO's focus from now on also become China? This is really important. And, and NATO is a critical, uh, very critical player. And, and focusing on China is key. You know, I, I worked with the... Uh, Deputy Secretary General of NATO, uh, Giovanna, um, in putting together the, the, the 5G network. And, you know, one of the things he said, I'll never forget, he goes, Keith, we need a clean NATO network because we can't afford to have a fractured NATO where some countries uh, have trusted 5G and others don't. You're only as strong as your weakest link. So I think this is, I, I think this is big. I think the other thing, too, is that when NATO joins forces, uh, it, it, you know, it, we could use a little bit of NATO philosophy. You know, one of the things that if you take, for example, uh, the clean network uh, to its uh, logical conclusion with these 60 uh, democracies that, that are part of that, is that if you retaliate, if you economically retaliate against one of the countries, then you've retaliated against all of us. And um, and that's how it is in NATO. And, but with the WTO, you can only retaliate back if you if you're the country that got retaliated on. So uh, I think this is a, this this is really, really key. Um, and there's no doubt the biggest threat is China. Despite the pandemic, China attracted more foreign direct and indirect investment in 2020 than any other country in the world. America and Europe are not the biggest investors in China right now. So do you think China can form its own economic alliance to counter the Western effort to rein in its unfair economic practices? So Simone, China can form uh, an economic alliance for the, for the mere fact nobody uh, trusts the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and that's crystal clear. You know, it was interesting for me going around to 40 countries uh, this last four, last fall. And what I saw was citizens of the world waking up to the Chinese Communist Party's uh, 
three C strategy of concealment, co-option, and coercion. And people now understand, they understand that the pandemic is a result of the concealment of the virus. And they've seen the co-option in Hong Kong has resulted in the evisceration of its citizens' freedoms. And, and now they're hearing about the coercion in Xinjiang has grown into punishable genocide. And I can tell you what, they don't like it. And now this has given uh, governments of the world and CEOs of the world the courage to stand up and confront uh, this China bully. Now, these guys are going to try to use, you know, seduce with money, reinforce with intimidation and retaliation. But uh, China has no friends. Uh, certainly they trust them. Last year, the U.S. direct investment in China dropped one-third, which means the U.S. companies are not looking into running factories or opening restaurants in China as much. However, Wall Street is expanding its business in China. Uh, BlackRock hired 320 people in Beijing and Hong Kong. So what do you think this will play out? Do you think President Biden will be able to rein in Wall Street? Well, Samoa, we, we've got to ask our business leaders a few questions. And that is, if corporate responsibility is social responsibility, then why are we still financing the CCP's genocide, surveillance state, and military buildup? And why is it that the U.S.'s largest asset managers talk a good game about protecting human rights, but research shows their track records way too often fail to comply with human rights framework? And, they, and, and why are they still actively financing companies that cause human harm? Another question is why has the ESG community done extraordinary little about applying environmental, social, and governance standards to CCP human rights abuses? And, and relatively nothing when it comes to enforcing those standards when it pertains to genocide in Xinjiang. The asset and ESG is social. It's about human rights and, of course, genocide. Now, as, as a former CEO of public companies and uh, former chairman of the Board of Trustees at Purdue, uh, I know these boards uh, and these various institutions have a moral obligation and a fiduciary duty to, uh, to divest from companies that are enabling human rights violations and, and to also disclose uh, their investments in Chinese companies. President Biden expanded the list to ban U.S. investment in China. What do you make of it? Does it hit the real target? My hat is really off to the Biden team for institutionalizing uh, capital market sanctions. This is the most powerful non-military tool uh, we have. Um, and they were able to institutionalize it by extending uh, our previous list of a total to a total of 59 Chinese military and surveillance companies. Now, the work that's left to be done is, is really twofold. So the first one is to ensure that within our government, we have continuity of policy um, among uh, our agencies. So to make sure that the Chinese companies that are on the DOD's Pentagon list, on the Commerce Department's Commerce Entity list, and also ones listed by the State Department with human rights are on that capital market sanction list. Now, this, the, the second uh, key thing left to be done uh, really seems obvious, and that is to get our allies joining us in these capital market sanctions to close all the doors. The G7 alone controls at least 85% of all capital markets in the world. Thank you, Secretary Kroc. This concludes our program for today. Please like, share, and subscribe to our channel if you like our production. You can also help me by donating to me. The donation link is underneath this video. I'm also on Rumble, Gap, Parlor, Locals, Safe Chat, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can always find me on my website, zoomingin.tv. 
Thanks for watching. I'm Simone Gao, and I'll see you next time.